lot of people were on some sort of journey. There were a lot of people who were questioning things they had been told growing up. People were questioning how they had been raised. People were trying to figure something out for themselves, right? And I was like, oh, these people are on a journey of self-discovery. And then there were also quite a lot of people who had experienced some form of sexual trauma or abuse, you know, and either were on a healing journey or were in a part of their life where it was very clear that they needed to take some time to heal. So for me, that was also another strong element. And I felt like there were also a couple of unicorns in the mix, people who had somehow you know, found some magical Alexa and were living their best sex lives. And I was like, oh my God, these are the people that I want to be like, you know? And I felt like even though some of those people were very different, they embodied a sense of sexual freedom. And I felt like many of us could learn from them. So that's really how the three themes came to me. And then the second part of your question was, how did I define Africa? How did I define sex lives? So I identify as a Pan-Africanist, which is also about, I think, the unity of the continent and the diaspora. So it was really important to me that in a book about Africa, it was inclusive of, you know, all of the people of African descent who are separated from the continent because of slavery, because of colonization, because of migration. So I almost wanted the book to be a space where, you know, Africans across the globe were brought together in one space. Yeah. Does that answer your question? And then can you, oh, yes. And then can you also talk about uh, women? Mm, mm, because it's yes. not always the case that, that you, you make the very specific point, which is of course is a specific point that ought to be made that some are identifying as women. Yes, yes, absolutely. So everybody I interviewed in my book identified as a woman, right? And I interviewed women who were cis women, and women who are also trans women. And for me, that was really important as well, right? Um, I mean, I'm a feminist. I don't believe in biological essentialism. I've always been more from the social constructivist school of thought. And for me, it was also important to show women and all their and all their diversity. It was especially important to me show, to show women who were also disabled, women who were living positively with HIV and AIDS, you know, women who had experienced female genital mutilation, women who were super religious, women who were not. I just wanted the book to show like the wide spectrum of womanhood that exists. Yeah, and I think the reason I wanted to hear your thoughts on these three definitions is because what's so brilliant about the book, um, as you will all either know or know by the end of this call when you read, and then when you read it, is that sex, um, incorporate so much more than what we immediately think of, you know, sexuality and relationships. And there's this great quote from Gabriella, who's a 40 year old Afro descendant, lesbian uh, from the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. And she says, sex is overrated, <laughs> which I love because I, I thought it just it was such a strong counterpoint to this, to the insistence on sex. She says, Sex is overrated. Just look at it from a social point of view. Sex is only one way of connecting with a person, yet everybody seems so fixated on it. Um, and I, I really liked that uh, very bold way of starting because um, it reminds us that there's so much that finds its way into, in some ways, the very narrow word of sex. For you, how broad does this, does this go? Mm, no, I love I love what Gabriella said as well. I, in a way, it's kind of funny when you're interviewing somebody for a book about sex for them to say that. But when she said that, it really resonated because I think sex is also more than the physical act. It's those acts of intimacy. It's those acts of, you know, care and love. Um, it also reminds me of my conversation with Alexis, who at the time I interviewed her was 71 years old also a lesbian in a relationship with another woman. And she spoke about how, you know, for her, for example, a meal and food is also part of the erotic, right? That's somebody who loves food. I was like, oh, I get that totally. And I think also when you're thinking about pleasure, it's really important for us to broaden our understanding of what sex is beyond a physical act, you know, done in a particular way, done between people of opposite genders to really have a more expansive understanding of sex because I think it also expands our possibilities for pleasure and joy in our bodies and in our life. 
And so this is the real challenge, right? Because you have such an expansive, as you, you've really widened the lens, let's say, on even these three terms. And yet we only hear from 32 or 31 people, including yourself. So how did you pick who made it, who made their way into the book? Because each person, I think, has such a rich testimony and point of view, and they each raise very specific issues. Um, and I imagine that was, of course, conscious. But how did you ultimately decide? I love this question because it assumes like I interviewed 100 people and I was like, this is the first 31, I'm going to include that. There was only one person I interviewed that I did not include in the book. And that's really because, you know, the story she told me was a really lovely story, but there wasn't much about sex in it. And I said, well, this is a book about sex, you know, and usually if I'd had an interview where I felt like, okay, I could have somehow gotten a bit more from the person, I would go back and have another conversation. There's some people I interviewed three times, but I have to confess by the time I interviewed this particular individual, I was at the end of my process, I was approaching my deadline. And so I was like, okay, it's going to be 32 women included myself. And for me, what this also tells me is that we all have incredible stories about sex and sexuality to tell, no matter who we are, no matter our backgrounds, because literally I felt like everybody I spoke to, their story was interesting. And you've read the book, so I'm sure you can attest to that as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, so um, just to be very specific, because I, I basically made a list. <laughs> <laughs> all of just just how expansive um your use of of sex is really oh. so in these stories you women approach everything from cyber sex to in-person sex kink bdsm celibacy they talk about polyamory bisexuality pansexuality transsexuality hiv positive um to be hiv positive they discuss politics race nationality age disability pregnancy uh, or lack thereof, the institutions of religion and of marriage, which is to say, Nana, as we progress, each testimony complicates and deepens the understanding of this vast phrase, sex lives of African women. And before I think going into some of the particularities of some of these testimonies, I think it would be useful to think about um, the kind of counterpoint to this liberation, which is what you describe as the boxes circumcised, circumscribed <laughs> by society, which is to say, like, what are the categories that you found reoccurring um, in these testimonies that prevent liberation and that oppress and um, suppress women? Mm. I feel like one of the things that was really, really clear from literally everybody I interviewed is nobody was really told anything about sex growing up. Very few people were told about sex growing up. If they were told anything at all, it was, you know, if you have sex, you will fall pregnant, end of story. There was nothing about sex can be for pleasure. You can have sex with the joy of it. You can have sex without falling pregnant. There was also an assumption that, you know, sex is an act, a penetrative act that happens between a man and a woman. Right, people were not told that you could have sex with people of the same gender, for instance. And so people grew up, people, including myself, grew up with very, very limited understanding of what sex is and what it can be. You know, that was something that was really, really common. A lot of the people I spoke to who also were raised in Christian um, households, you know, also had a lot of fear around sex. Um, and for some people, it was like, well, how do you go from you know, being raised with such a fearful understanding of sex and suddenly you're married and expected to, you know, enjoy sex and have children. Yeah, this was really common. Also, a lot of people had experienced child sexual abuse as children. So you had parents on one hand not wanting to talk to their children about sex because they felt somehow they're protecting them, you know, from something big and scary out there. Meanwhile, I think that sometimes makes children even more vulnerable to sexual abuse because they have this sense of shame and fear around sex. They're unable to speak to their parents and they somehow feel conflicted, like they have done something bad or attracted something bad towards themselves. This is interesting that the education point is one that I also picked up on. Um, and I first of all felt that uh, a very good resource in sex ed classes would be your book. <laughs> Thank you. I, agree. Um, I don't know if you've been approached 
um, for this particular um, kind of sharing of resource. But I, I, I do wonder if you if you could wave wave your magic wand and add certain things into sex education classes. What would you? How would you design it? What's missing, mm. and what is what is needed? Yeah, you know, I had uh, last year a workshop with young girls around sex. Um, I attended this conference, the 10th All Africa Conference on Sexual Health and Rights. And I was invited to speak to young girls between the ages of 13 to 18 about sex. And I was a bit nervous about it because I'm used to speaking to adults, right? So I started my session by asking people what they wanted to know. And I was shocked how many young girls said they wanted their parents to speak to them about sex. You know, and I think this is what parents need to know. I think parents, and I'm a parent, but of a very young child. <laughs> um, she's just about to turn three. I think parents have a lot of fear about speaking to their children about sex. And people struggle to figure out what is age appropriate, which is completely understandable. And from the little I have experienced as a parent, I feel like you just kind of need to respond to children where they are, depending on what they're seeing and depending on what they're, in a sense, how they're reacting to their own bodies, right? So my daughter, like for the last couple of weeks, whenever she's, she's being potty trained, so whenever she sits on the potty and goes, now when I try to wipe her vulva, she's like squeezing her thighs together and giggling. I don't understand where it's coming from, right? And I'm like, okay, does it feel ticklish? And she's like, yes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you the tissue and you know you can wipe yourself and so what I've started saying to her when I give her a bath is you know only mommy and auntie Getty are allowed to touch your vulva and to touch your bottom and I've been very deliberate about teaching her words for different parts of her body you know sometimes we bath together so she giggles and she's like she likes to touch my brush she likes to touch my nipples and I think that's how you start really by trying to normalize really we should normalize our bodies because they are bodies they provide a home for us and to just I think try and create an environment where children are able to ask us questions and you know to just accept their bodies as normal and not feel like a sense of shame around it so so education in other words really starts at home I think it absolutely starts at home that's yeah. absolutely where it needs to start from. And then, you know? interestingly, thinking about, let's say, if we move further along in the, in the age development range into school, I guess the, the logic possibly of your book, it follows, because this is talking about the sex lives, it's implied by the title, of Black, African and Afro-descendant women, would a yeah. syllabus, would classes um, need to kind of address the particularities of... I suppose one's upbringing, one's family circumstances, you know, so the one of the major points of your book, of course, is that um, these women's sex lives are different based because of a history of colonialism and slavery and um, persecution, um, certainly in the 21st century, but historically. So would a, would a, a syllabus, a sex education syllabus need to reflect these, these differences? Absolutely. And I think they need to depict the differences and also show the differences as what they are, normal, a part of life, a part of the diversity of life, right? Like I would really like for a syllabus um, that's talking about families to show different types of families. I'm a single mother, for example. And, you know, there was there's clearly, there's clearly, there's clearly a period where my daughter was being taught about school, about families, and she'd come home and say, where's daddy? I wish her school would have, you know, shown her different types of families, right? They could show a family with a man and a woman. They could show a family with two women. They could show a family which is a grandmother, a mother, and a child. Not all families, you know, have a man and woman as, you know, as part of the family. And for me, this is like really, really important. Okay, I want to I want to dive into one uh, testimony in part because it's um, related to France, and since we are in the very mm. in Paris, and also because I want to give people on the um, in the audience a sense of basically what the book looks like. So, as we said, it, it you we hear from thirty one uh, women, and so within these three sections, um, basically that they're, they're introduced with a, a short kind of paragraph. Um, describing their age, where they're from, 
and a brief almost synopsis of what we're about to hear. And then we hear their testimony. So this is from um, Maureen. And I'm just reading um, what you wrote here, Nana. Maureen, 29-year-old het heterosexual woman. She was born in the Côte d'Ivoire and raised in France. She's had multiple lovers, lovers, but apart from a two month long relationship, she's never had an official boyfriend. In this story, she grapples with the impact of racism on her sense of self-worth and confidence. And like many stories, like all stories in the book, um, it's a first person testimonial. It's about 10 pages long. It's intimate and it's flowing and it's profound. She says, as a dark skinned black girl growing up in France, you're never chosen. Nobody sends you a letter saying you're not desirable. You can just see that the girls who have boyfriends are not like you. Um, you mentioned that some of these women you interviewed three times, you mentioned in the book that some of the, this is the first time that some women have ever even opened up to you uh, or opened up to anyone for that matter. Um, can you tell us about this interview process? Mm. Um, whether in person or virtual, how did you uh, approach it? How did you yourself uh, learn and grow and change as an interviewer? And then how did you edit down the conversations into these really moving first person accounts where you capture the spirit and the voice um, of these women so beautifully, I think? Hmm. No, thank you, thank you. So, like you can imagine, everybody's process was different. With Maureen in particular, I interviewed her when she was at Ghana. She happened to attend to be in Ghana for a festival and we'd already been in communication. I, she was one of the people who responded to a call out I did on Twitter. So there were many ways I found the people I interviewed. There were times where I would do a call out, you know, so literally post and say, I'm writing a book about the sex lives of African women. Would you want to respond? And the one that Maureen was, responded to, I had particularly said, I am looking for stories of people living their best sex lives. And that was because I had done a series of interviews where I had been focused on like sad experiences and sexual abuse. And I was like, oh my God, this is so heavy. I need like a light, fun interview where I'm feeling inspired. And then Maureen responded saying, I don't have a happy story to share, but I do want you to interview me. How do you say no to that? You can't say no to that, right? Um, and then a couple of months later, she told me she was going to be in Ghana. So I thought, great, let's interview her in person. So I had never met Maureen before. She was a total stranger to me. She was in my country. She was also one day having a really bad day. And you know, she reached out to me and I was like, okay, you can come to my house, spend the night. So she came to my house, spent the night and the following day we did the interview. Oh, no, it was the same day we did the interview. I remember we were in my living room, you know, we cracked open a bottle of wine um, and we started chatting. Um, I think the thing that I always tried to do with anybody else interviewing, whether I was interviewing them in person or via Zoom, was to create a space where they felt comfortable, where they felt safe. You know, people were telling me deeply personal stories. I feel like even for themselves, people were telling themselves deeply personal stories, right? Because I think it's a hard thing to admit and to say I have never felt loved before I've never felt chosen and you know to have certain realizations um you know um like part of what Maureen shared in her story was how at some point in time she realized how she had internalized racism and that was affecting her choice of lovers you know um so for me it was really about creating this space where people felt comfortable they felt able to speak I would record all my interviews, I would transcribe them, I would, you know, go with the transcripts, I would highlight the bits that sort of spoke to me, and I would, in a sense, retell that story in the first person. I felt like, and I feel like in general, first person stories are compelling, people can really, in a sense, always put their shoes, their feet in the shoes of the person telling the story. It allows people to empathize. I really wanted people to understand each person's point of view. And I think I also wanted people overall to have a sense of, oh, all these experiences are different, yet they are all real, right? And they're all valid. People are telling you their own stories. You can't, in my opinion, invalidate a story that somebody tells you. You can't say, oh, that's not true, because it is true. It is their life. Mm. I also think it's, um, I, I found it, well, first of all, it, 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 I think it um, collapses the space 
that the third person creates because they're so present they're so pre clearly present on the page mm. um, and and hearing that I again and again um, and the way that the I you use the I throughout because as you know it's all these different women talking but the way that that I then kind of as you say manages to contain the diversity of all of the eyes but it's still the I um, the I the the first person device I, I found that really um, compelling and I also think it gave some of these women who as you say you know um, whether Maureen or, or others who have had very difficult experiences in their sexual lives or outside of their sexual lives um, it gave them so much agency and there was one woman um, Miss Deviant <laughs> who describes the shift from um, being fucked to fucking and mm -hmm. I think you know a lot of these women ha 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 were, were passive agents in their life and you really made them active agents by giving them this very strong um, eye so I, th I thought that was really moving thank you thank you so much and you and I wanted to ask you about this too because you you write some described our conversations as therapeutic a healing uh, that I benefited from and that I hope you the reader did as well what did you because my next question of course is you decided to be interviewed for the book and that you and you said that this this you realized over the course of your interviews that you had to be included what did you find that these interviews were bringing up for you and why did you ultimately insert yourself into this um conversation let's say mm. Yeah, I felt like I did not want to be an anthropologist. <laughs> you know, I did not want to be like getting all like all of this detail out of people's lives and be sort of standing back from from that process of self examination, right? I felt like the feminist thing to do was actually to also put myself under the lens and also make myself vulnerable. Um, that felt to me like a necessary feminist act because for me, this project was really driven by my feminist politics, you know, um, and, and I felt like, yes, I too am the subject. I am not just in a sense studying people, right? I too am the subject. I too have to be vulnerable. I too have to tell my story with the world. And now I can't remember the first part of your question. <laughs> You see, you you write in the book that it was um, that some of the the conversations were therapeutic and healing. Where did you find that happening? And I imagine since some of the women um, were telling this to anyone for the first time that they they had realizations that they hadn't had before. Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about the behind the scenes process? A lot of crying, a lot of laughter. Are you in touch with these women? I mean, how kind of deep does the healing and therapy, I suppose, run? Mm, yes. So speaking personally, in terms of what I found, like healing and therapeutic, I found the conversations with older women, those were my absolute favorite. I think we live, we live in a world which desexualizes older women, right? Um, and almost makes you, as somebody who's either young or kind of like middle-aged, which is how I think of myself now, fearful about aging. And speaking to older women was inspirational. I was just like, oh, there's nothing to be scared about, right? You can still be old and fully within your body and still have access to pleasure and find partners. It was inspirational to me that Alexis had found love in her 60s, right? Um, so for me, that was a form of healing. It was a form of healing from, I think, living in a world that says, you know, young is hot and attractive and old is, you know, dusty and, and on the shelf and I'm still in touch with many of the women that I interviewed for the book um one of them is actually working on a play inspired by the book which has been amazing um I'm also going to attend a birthday party of another person in April so so many of them have stayed like part of my my network that's it's so really lovely nice. that the old the um this talking to old women who, of course, always have so, so much wisdom, I feel totally similarly. Um, but I wonder, by contrast, were there certain topics or certain areas which you felt that you were just holding space, but you couldn't really engage with or you had to do research about in order to really understand um, and contextualize what these people were telling you, their particular stories or particular topics? Um, 
that you had to learn about in order to really understand them? I think I was quite lucky, right? Because I was entering this work as somebody who has been a feminist and been in activist spaces for, you know, gosh, close to, or maybe like two decades now. So the issues were not unfamiliar to me, right? Um, I think what was challenging was holding space for people because I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, you know, and yet at the same time, my process meant I was going to ask people deeply personal questions. Um, I was going to ask them questions which might trigger really bad memories for them. And, and so I just needed to hold space in a way that was thoughtful and also give people, you know, space to stop. There were some interviews where we stopped, you know, took a break, came back in 10 minutes. Um, and I think you just need to do that with, with work of this kind. And again, I feel like my, you know, feminist training in that sense prepared me for this. There, there, there's that. And then I wonder, and I think um, I certainly, there were some, there were some terms that I had, you know, of course, read in passing or heard about, but it also strikes me, Nana, that um, some terms in the book, because this is a conversation that's evolving so quickly in part because of books like yours, it's sometimes hard to slightly keep up with what is the, you know, now outdated word to use, what's the new word, what's even the new concept, um, especially when, so basically the question is about labels and how labels change quickly. Mm. Um, so yes, on the one hand, yes. you have somebody like Sol Solange, who's a 46 year old queer trans woman. And she, yeah. you write, describes herself as queer because it signifies an openness which is expansive and inclusive of her identity as a heterosexual woman who loves men. So here she's using um, queer, not possibly like technically, but more to signify something. And then we have, you mentioned Alexis and she's a great, she's such a great figure. She's a 71 year old black uh, queer feminist born in Harlem and identifies as Afro-Caribbean. And she says, she has a different point of view about terms. She says, I know people who are 20 or 30 years younger than I am, who already have that sense of themselves. And I'm happy about that. I have been here longer, um, but I've had a, a longer road to travel in terms of the ways black communities identify, uh, identify those of us who are also black, but don't identify as heterosexual. I hope in time, all of these labels and terminologies will fall away. I don't know if it will happen in my lifetime, but I'm hoping that there will be a day when people don't have to resist and articulate a sexuality based on its opposition to another. I guess the question is, when is it useful to articulate and label and identify? And when is it, or do you, like Alexis, want it to ultimately fall away? Oh gosh, <laughs> that is such a tough question. You know, um, I think it really depends. I think labels are useful to find your people, to find like-minded people, to build community. Um, and labels are useful for that. But I think labels are also useful to give you a sense of identity, right? Labels that you choose for yourself. Um, there are some labels that may describe who I am technically, but for some reason, not the other, they're not labels that resonate with me. So I'll never describe myself as such, even if I am such, right? Like, I think what it says just, I think it just comes from like your, like, like the moment you came to consciousness, what was popular, you know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So you may use a label just because like maybe when you're in university and you were studying gender, this was a term you identified with and now that term is like so old fashioned, but you're kind of old yourself. And so that's a label you like, you know, or there's a label that politically resonates with you um, and, and that's what you go for. So I really think it depends upon the individual, but I find labels helpful really just to build community. Like I tend to describe myself as a Pan-Africanist feminist, right? And so anybody else describing themselves as a Pan-Africanist feminist, I'm like, oh, we've got something in common. Personally, I rarely define myself according to my sexuality, but it doesn't mean my sexuality is not important to me. It's just not, it's just not in my Twitter bio, you know? But Pan-Africanist feminist is probably my Twitter bio. But I'm not going to knock anybody for whom that's important to include in the Twitter bio. That's important to them. 
And that's what I was trying to respect by asking people how they identified, right? And you said, this is why you have all of the different labels in the book because people identify differently. And for me, it was also important to show that variety. Yeah, and that's, I think that's what's so wonderful too about um, since you interviewed women from basically every decade um, of different different ages, you get a you get a flavor, as you say, of how this discussion has evolved based on the language and the terms that they're using. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And this, I mean, this is a kind of larger point. It's not really a question, but I think it it does highlight what I also like so much about this, the book too, is that oftentimes this discussion, I mean, is had in a kind of very prescriptive way. And apart from your interview at the end, and as I mentioned at the beginning, your prologue and your epilogue, your your invisibility um, and kind of lack of saying, this is how it should be. This is, it's, 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 you're, it's just like you're holding up um, a mirror to society as it is and letting that mirror speak for itself. And I found that so subtle because these conversations that I had about the, these all of these topics today, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of, I mean, you use the word in the book, you talk about being cancelled and, and, and not wanting to be cancelled, you know, there, there's a lot of um, emotion that's, that comes into these conversations, and it, it just felt so calm and composed. <laughs> thank you, thank you, <laughs> that's good yeah. feedback to have. Yeah, yeah, I had, I had a question too about, um, so many of the women you, you interview identify as queer, bisexual, curious. Others, though, are heterosexual and talk about the men in their lives, um, talk about the experiences they've had with men. And in some ways, men, or those pe or people who identify as men, are the kind of silent and absent interlocutors in some of these stories. Um, this is also a hypothetical question, but what might the book have looked like if you'd call it the sex lives of African men? <laughs> 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 and, and you know since men aren't all what are some of the what are some of the boxes um this that are that are prescribed by society that men are trapped in do, do you feel oh gosh I feel like men are trapped in so many boxes I just want them to do the work of you know getting out of the boxes yeah exactly um and, you know, I've had like a few men ask me, so when are you going to write the sex lives of African men? And I'm like, I'm leaving it to you guys to do that for yourself. But what would the book have been like if it was called The Sex Lives of African Men? I don't know, because I have never written such a book. <laughs> well, I would love for somebody to do that, though. I'm no, but I, I guess the question behind it, I guess the question behind it is what you know, you mentioned that you interviewed these women and out of those interviews emerged yeah. these kind of three major trends yeah. and that, that's how you break the book up. And then I guess the question is, were there, was, did you get the sense that there was a recur, there were recurring issues that men were facing or recurring themes that these men who again, weren't, you weren't interviewing them, but they were these ca other characters in the stories. Um, was that, were there common threads in what you were hearing about the men? It's a great question. I have to say, I didn't dwell too deeply on, on, on like, yes, obviously, there are men's stories in there, right? Because plenty of women have sexual relationships with men, and there were, you know, stories of men who had caused women a lot of harm, who had sexually abused women, who had, you know, those stories come to mind. Um, I think there were a few stories of men who had, you know, opened up the sex lives of the women they were with. There were stories of men who had almost coerced women into relationships that they now felt they needed out of, even though they had, you know, entered those relationships out of what they thought was their free choice, but later realized that actually I was almost cajoled into this relationship because this man never said, never took no for an answer, right? Uh, and so I feel like if there was a, a book looking at the sex lives of African men, you would also need to look at how are men raised and how are men taught to approach their sexuality, right? I feel like a lot of men are probably still taught, you know, like, you like this person, go after the person, right? So they don't literally hear the no. They feel like women need to be persuaded and cajoled and, and wooed. But what does it mean when you're not hearing the no? Um, yeah. 
Okay. No, so I, that was just an interesting, um, I just, it just occurred to me that if, if there had been any threads. Um, mm. I also, it occurs to me too, Nana, that you've been promoting this book for a while. You do many of these, you're very generous with your time. Um, and, and, and I think have had many meetings and discussions about the book. Um, I think both in person and virtually. What story or which handful of stories have really resonated with readers in a way that you possibly didn't expect? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I can tell you the stories which have resonated, or I feel have resonated with readers a lot, and I don't know if I'm saying this because those are the stories that also resonated with me a lot. Um, I don't know if I had any particular expectations. I don't think I have particular expectations. But I think Alexa's story, we've already talked about Alexis a couple of times. And I feel like, you know, Alexis comes up in almost every event I do. Um, um, the woman from Senegal, I don't know why her name, Nura's story, which is the very first story in the book. You know, a woman from Kenya who moves to Senegal to be the third wife of a Senegalese man that really strikes people, right? Um, people are surprised by her choice, but at the same time, like, oh my gosh, she has so much agency. Who would have thought, you know, a polygamous, uh, a woman in a polygamous marriage would have so much agency. A lot of people love the story of Helen Banda, who's a Malawian American, and, you know, she and her husband after 10 years decided to open up their marriage. Um, a lot of people love that story, it resonates with them. Um, yeah, I feel like these three stories, Alexis, Helen, Nura, tend to come up quite a bit. And for you, is there other stories that maybe at the beginning that have grown on you and, and grown mm. on you in, in surprising ways? Because I, I think that's as you as you continue to return to a book or any kind of, I think, cultural object, it does change as you change. Mm. Mm. Yeah. One of the things I've realized is in events, I tend to like to read from the sexual freedom or self-discovery story. And sometimes I've been challenging myself a bit more to read from the healing stories. And I'm like, actually, it's not all doom and gloom, right? Um, there's always like light, even when people have had a difficult experience. So just that whole range of stories in there, whether it's Selma's story or Titsi's story, I find that they resonated with me now, the more I talk about the book. And that gets back to what you were saying at the beginning about these women who you say have kind of found, you described it as a magical Alexia to, to, to open up their sexual freedom. So can you tell us a bit about what, if there are common themes within the healing process? I mean, you talk about therapy, you talk about journaling. Um, what other maybe more practical things could you say about healing, what it looks like for them and also what it's looked like for you in your life? I think one of the realizations I had in writing this book was both how healing looks different for everybody. And I felt like the thing that was common, that was important was actually space to heal, right? First of all, space and time to reflect, to recognize there's something that you need to heal from. I feel like that's something that I also took away from this book. I, I'm one, I'm somebody who likes to compartmentalize. And so when I decided to interview for myself for this book, in terms of the process, you know, I asked a friend to interview me because I was like, how do I do this? And I was very surprised that the story that came was actually of, initially was the story of um, child sexual abuse that I experienced as a child. I thought I was going to be able to tell like a fun sex positive story, but that's not what came. And if I hadn't in a sense taken that time to allow myself to be vulnerable and just to answer questions in the way I was interviewing people, I wouldn't have known that this is something that I was in a sense still holding on to. So I think there's something about the space and time, you know, to reflect and to figure out whatever it is that you want to work through and to figure out ways of working through that, you know, um, that don't completely destabilize you and, you know, um, send you around the bend. And I think that looks very different for everybody. For some people, obviously, professional help may be needed. For some people, they want to do it through a spiritual practice. Some people want to go on a retreat. For some people, sex itself was healing, you know, sex with different partners, sex with different people. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, 
yeah <laughs> we have I want to integrate this question in because I, I have a, I want to first of all encourage people in the audience to please post questions um we have about uh 15 or so minutes left and so I'll be turning to your questions and comments Ida's already posted one but um to everyone else in the audience go ahead and post them and I'll start to integrate them into our final questions Ida says uh were there any stories which really shocked you um or moved you in a positive way I guess so yeah. shocking and then very moving I mean yeah. Ida I can say having just read this a lot of them <laughs> but <laughs> you want to hear Nana's specific response yeah a story that moved me in a positive way um, was the story of Waris. So Waris is a woman who originates from Somalia who experienced female genital mutilation as a child. And prior to interviewing her, I was under the impression that if you had experienced female genital mutilation, that it was impossible to, for you to experience sexual pleasure. And so I remember she was telling me about, you know, this incredibly orgasmic experience she'd had. And like, I was just like, what? Like, how? How is this possible? You know? Um, and so she was like, Nana, remember the clitoris is expansive and it goes all the way up your body and what we see on the outside, that's not all there is to it, right? So that was just like a reminder of, in a sense, the miracle of women's bodies, but also, you know, a reminder and holding up a mirror to myself of like the myths and misconceptions that I myself have. You know, um, of course, FGM is a terrible act, you know, and um, whereas herself is an activist against it. But then I think it's also important for women who have experienced this in any, you know, any form of harm to know that they can still find healing. They can still find a way to access joy and pleasure in their body. And for me, that was, in a sense, what I took away from that story. That's lovely. So it was it was shocking and positive both. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Eliza H says, uh, "Will there be new episodes for the podcast?" Absolutely love your work. Oh, thank you so much, Eliza. I am so excited to hear that. And yes, I also have a podcast. It's called Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. So this is my little plug for others who may not have heard the podcast. And we've literally just started work on season two now. So yes, more episodes are coming. Thank you for listening. Okay, I have. I wanted to respond to what you said about this idea of time, the space and heal, and and basically opening it up for yourself and for other people. Because what really struck me uh, in reading the book is how um, different people, basically, what different people chose to tell you. Um, although, so this is this was, I guess, the question I kind of had about editing, and possibly even did you send people questions or even the parameters of what the conversation would be like beforehand? Because some people they say, you know. They begin right at the beginning of their life and they tell you the whole story. Some people go to a very traumatic moment. Um, in other words, the framing of these people's testimonies is really different. And what they include uh, and exclude is also different. And I wonder how much of that was coming from them, because, as you say, different people respond to space and time differently. And how much of that was your editing? That's the first. Well, I'd love to hear about that. Let me, let me answer the first question because I'll yeah. get the time to get to the second question. So I didn't send people questions beforehand. Um, and I also didn't send people stories like to approve before they were published, right? I didn't have a set of questions that I would ask. I would start a conversation and usually I'll start by asking people how they identified in terms of their gender and sexuality. That was like the question I would ask everybody to begin with. And then I would go off in different directions depending upon my mood. But when it came to the writing process, I would think of, you know, I, this is where the creativity and my creativity as a writer would come in. I would think of how do I grab people? How do I get people interested in the story? So I'll start from wherever I wanted to start from, you know, um, as opposed to where the story started from when I was when I was doing the interview. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, totally. I, I, love, I love that you really, <laughs> you tuned into the mood. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um, that's what I did mm. and then also what struck me about what you were saying about healing and I was struck by this when you said healing from the bias or the prejudice about old age again you're using and this it's just a testament to your expansive view here but you're using healing in such a wide sense because you're saying mm. there are so many wounds from which one can heal wounds that you might even not even know to call wounds yeah. um can you talk about maybe some less obvious places that 
um, maybe they're less obvious because everyone's been hurt and needs to heal because there's a pervasiveness to that um, hurt. Mm. So to talk about less um, obvious places where people need to heal from. Mm. Yeah, I would say, I don't know if that's less obvious, but I feel like we all need to heal from limited constructions of what womanhood is, what femininity is, right? Um, limited conceptions of what agendas are and what it means to be a woman or what it means to be a girl, you know? Um, I think we need more expansiveness and an understanding of identities because that gives us room to be multiple people. I feel like we're not one person. Um, I think we need to recognize that, you know, in the same way, sexuality can be on a spectrum. Agendas can be on a, on a spectrum as well. And who you are in your 20s doesn't have to be who you are in your 40s or your 60s. You know, I feel like we should allow ourselves some um, space to grow, to change, to transform. Uh, and for me, that's like beautiful. And that feels to me like also like part of life, right? Um, yeah, if you're not constantly growing and changing, then it's somehow in, gives the impression that you're stagnating. Yeah, and this gets to a, this gets to two quotes that I wanted to read because it, I guess the other thing that you really emphasize is that this is an active and ongoing process. And it's not as if you would heal and then be healed. And the, mm -hmm. sa and you, the same thing is, is true, I think, about freedom. And so you, I, I just pulled these two quotes that I thought were so beautiful. One is, um, the journey towards sexual freedom is not a linear one or one that is fixed or static. Freedom is a state that we are constantly trying to reach. You also write, freedom is not a destination that one arrives at and can choose to stay at forever and ever. Freedom is a constant state of being, an energy and state that we need to nurture and protect. Freedom is a safe home that one can return to over and over again. And there's a sense of it's an ongoing daily, weekly practice, healing, preserving your freedom, coming back to this question. Absolutely. Because I feel like the world we live in is fragile, right? Sometimes mm. we think their rights we've won and it's sorted and it's done and dusted. And then something happens and we're like, oh my gosh, we have to hold the line. All this right we thought we had has been taken away, mm. you know? Um, so there's something about constant struggle, you know, struggle to be. And also what freedom might mean for you today might be very different for what freedom might mean for you in a decade and I think we need to allow ourselves that kind of space and at the same time we need to allow ourselves to enjoy the journey right because that's what we're all on and and to enjoy that as much and not be fixed on a particular destination because one we may get there and find that's not the ultimate destination or we may get there and find we're the wrong destination so I think it really is about enjoying the path yeah, you have, um, I love this quote from Ebony, who says, are you happy? She asks herself constantly, are you happy today? Mm -hmm. And if the response is no, then change whatever's making you unhappy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was a beautiful piece of inspiration. <laughs> um, you also mentioned, Nana, uh, you, and there are a lot of women in the book who are activists, and this is a kind of erotic thing that it's very powerful to be in these activist spaces. Um, people feel very accepted. They feel like they can heal their... Um, in your evolution as an activist, who are some other writers or thinkers that you turn to and have read that have formed and shaped your framework of activist framework? Oh gosh, there's so many. Yeah. Um, I'm going to mention some African feminist activists, especially because I feel like their names don't get mentioned enough in like global spaces, especially when it comes to the work of sexualities. So there's a Ugandan feminist academic called Sylvia Tamale, who has just done really incredible work. Um, she's the editor of a book called The African Sexualities Reader, which is basically an anthology um, and really incredible. Um, Hakima Bass and Sukari Ekin did another reader called Queer Africa, which I really love. Um, Mina Salami has a great blog, Miss Afropolitan. Um, Rama Diang did this anthology which I contributed to on feminist parenting. Um, these are these are some of the people, yeah, that I'd like to name check. There's so many more people who I'm sure at the minute I get on this call, I'm like, I shouldn't mention this people, this person as well. Yeah, but yeah, I've just I've just put one in the chat and you you're very welcome to email me after so we can we can sh sh spread spread the word. 
to yes to the callers um <laughs> wendy riley posted a article to an article a link to an article that i've not read i don't know if you've read this it was in the boston globe i'm just reading the a group of grandmothers in zimbabwe is helping the world reimagine mental health care do you know about i think it? i've heard of the story i haven't clicked on the link but if it's the story i'm thinking about is granny is basically sitting on benches counseling people right is that correct? yeah yeah this is the friendship bench yeah yeah yes Yes, yes. So I've heard about this and it sounds incredible. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a good way to look at healing because it's not affordable for everybody to have mm. professional therapy. And at the same time, I'm like, this is labor that these grandmothers are doing. You know, how are they being compensated? Right. Um, yeah. Um, and I guess another question I had, Nana, is so I talked about stories that have resonated um, with you and stories that have resonated um in kind of more formal events but have have you also I imagine you have had people write in and say you know just reading your book for me based on my experience was healing itself you know this is that's the final sentiment of your book which is saying that I found this experience to be I found a lot of empathy I I, I learned a lot from this experience and I hope that the reader does too has it been in fact your experience that people are writing in and saying thank you for I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading the story. I'm hearing this voice. I never thought I'd hear this voice. This really reminds me of my experience. Yes, and and that's been the most rewarding feedback. You know, I've had particularly young queer Africans say to me, you know, I've never felt so seen in my life. Exactly that phrase. I've had that phrase from so many people, and that's been heartwarming. I've had people say to me, I'm feeling as bad to start my journey of self discovery. You know. Um, that's the kind of feedback I've received and that's really been the best. 